This is Buffalo Creek, West Virginia, a steep, rugged valley in the heart of Appalachia. The surrounding region of Logan County became known as the birthplace of the Hatfield-McCoy feud, and later as one of the most prolific producers of coal in the United States. But since February 26, 1972, it's better known as a place torn apart by a dreadful engineering disaster, one that killed 125 people and forever altered a community. The roots of the disaster are deeply embedded in the history of coal mining. Getting coal out of the ground has always been a labor-intensive activity and a dangerous one. Methane poisoning, cave-ins, and explosions are just some of the hazards that plague miners. In 1925 alone, 686 workers died in the mines of West Virginia. Over the decades, hard-fought gains in safety conditions and increased automation made coal mining a somewhat less hazardous job. But one aspect of the coal mining operation remained dangerously unchecked. Coal waste dams. Unlike traditional dams, coal waste dams provide neither electricity nor a reservoir of potable water. They are essentially gigantic garbage dumps. You mine coal, and coal usually has some material in it that's not coal. You run it through different processes and you end up with coal and then you end up with refuse. And these processes include uh, the use of water. So now you have, you, have, you have refuse you have to get rid of and water you have to get rid of. For years, mining companies dumped the wastewater directly into streams, including Buffalo Creek. But early environmental laws put a stop to that. The companies were required to at least make an effort to try to control the wastewater from the plant. And the cheapest thing for them to do was just to build a dam across the valley. In 1960, the Laredo Mining Company built what became known as Dam Number no. 1, overlooking the narrow valley of Buffalo Creek. The dam was built of coal waste, also called gob, which smoldered and often caught fire due to its high carbon content. When number one's reservoir became filled with silt, the mining company built the larger dam, number two, right behind it, on soft clay soil with little shear strength. Several near failures plagued the first two dams. Dam number one overtopped several times, and there were black water discharges that came into Buffalo Creek. Dam number two failed. The front face of it failed and split in the middle uh, a, a couple of times in the late 60s. The U.S. Geological Survey reported that the dams were, in fact, vulnerable to a washout. And there was evidence of foundation failure piping in both structures, and particularly in dam number two. But the company went ahead and built the third dam anyway. Dam number three was to be massive, 500 feet thick in the middle, stretching 465 feet across the valley, and rising 60 feet above dam number two's impoundment pond. Despite the dam's size, and the fact that it was to be built overlooking a floodplain, home to several small towns, the only engineering plan was this rudimentary sketch. At the time, engineering requirements for coal dams and federal enforcement were sorely lacking. There was just one provision that said any refuse embankments and impoundments should be substantially constructed. That was it, one, one paragraph. The mining company's bulldozers began forming the giant face of dam number three in 1968. The coarse refuse material was not compacted. It was dumped by large trucks and then pushed into the center of the valley out on top of the slurry that had been discharged by the previous dams. There's no way one could get compaction with that thick uh, a layer of material being pushed forward. So there was no strength whatsoever in the material. In addition, the dam was built without proper spillways to alleviate the reservoir when it reached capacity. Such basic engineering deficiencies made a catastrophe virtually inevitable. The front face of the dam failed, I believe, in both 1969 and again in 1971. So there had been two failures of the front face of dam number three 
prior to February 26, 1972. Anybody with engineering knowledge knew that there were some serious problems with dam number three and its long-term stability. Despite such evidence, the Pittston Company, the dam's final owners, did not make the needed structural changes. 8 a.m., February 26, 1972. Four years of runoff from the mine and seasonal rains had swollen the dam's reservoir to 132 million gallons. Anxious residents noted large cracks in the dam's face. The crest had become soft. The mining company officials, uh, even though they had no real engineering knowledge, took it upon themselves to tell people that there was no danger and they should go home or stay in their homes. And it was only uh, some local residents who actually warned their neighbors and got some people out. Somebody did call my mother and told her that there was fear, I guess, up on the creek that the dam would break. And so we kind of knew something was going on. We didn't have any clue how bad it was going to be, though. Water had saturated so deeply into the dam's interior that a third of its face slid off into the impoundment pond of dam number two. The remainder of the dam then failed catastrophically. It simply liquefied, unleashing massive amounts of energy as it overtopped dams one and two on its unstoppable path to the valley below. The flood announced itself with loud explosions as it slammed into the smoldering gob pile that was dam number one. The town of Saunders was directly below. And so within a matter of moments, the whole town of Saunders was obliterated by this mass of water and slurry. The 20-foot high flood wave surged with 132 million gallons of water and 1 million gallons of sludge. It gained momentum from gravity and from its own increasing mass as it grabbed up mud, coal waste, and soon, houses and cars. I could see the creek and I could see all this black water coming down it and, you know, I'm thinking, we got some type of flood and then I seen that white house float down and hit the bridge and, you know, the house just splintered all the pieces and the water backed up and started coming over toward where I was at. As some scrambled up the cold, muddy hillsides to escape, they looked back to see houses floating by with people still looking out the windows. Houses that were soon smashed to bits along overpasses and railroad trestles. When the trestles started breaking, I heard a lot of people screaming. And we found out later that there were people on the trestle when it broke. The torrent of water and waste cut a 17-mile swath of destruction through the 17 small towns along Buffalo Creek before joining the Guyandot River. It was all over by 11 a.m. 125 people died. 1,000 more were injured. 507 houses, 44 mobile homes, and 30 businesses were destroyed. 4,000 people were left homeless. It was like you had civilization one day, and then it was pure chaos the next day, and that chaos lasted for a very, very, very long time. Entire families died together. There was friends and friends of friends and relatives of relatives uh, that, that died. Uh, a lot of funerals to go to. Rage they followed get grief. Money's money, uh, cooperators' money and elect you politicians, and you get to Washington and you care nothing about us. As with other disasters of this scale, the Buffalo Creek Dam disaster was a shocking wake-up call to federal and state agencies. The Army Corps of Engineers and the Mine Safety and Health Administration, or MSHA, launched a comprehensive inspection of coal waste dams across the nation. We felt that we needed to have an engineering analysis of what was available and be able to tell the mining community, if you're going to build these things, here's what you got to do. Out of the horror of Buffalo Creek came a remarkable era of dam improvement, where before almost no regulations existed. MSHA and other agencies wrote detailed engineering specifications. They demonstrated how proper engineering, combined with vigilant public scrutiny, can prevent a tragedy like Buffalo Creek from happening again 